Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hi, everyone. My name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I am pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts presentation titled, When Lack of Motivation Runs in the Family, Getting Kids with ADHD Organized and Focused for Learning. Leading today's presentation is Anne Dolan. Anne has nearly 30 years of experience working with students. She is a former public school education teacher, author, and founder of Educational Connections, a company that specializes in helping students build executive function skills and study habits to perform better in school. Kids are better able to focus on schoolwork when they live in a home that's organized and conducive to learning. For children with ADHD and their caregivers with ADHD, that order is easier said than achieved. In today's webinar, Anne will explain why and how to build a structured environment for your family. We'd like to begin today's webinar by asking a sort of fun poll question to our live audience. If you could win any of the following services for a year, which one would you select? You'll see the, the choices there. Tell us your answers. Um, comment to let us know if it's something else. Um, and tell us more. While you're doing that, I will note that answers to common webinar questions about slides, transcripts, and certificates of attendance are available on the FAQ tab in your webinar screen. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, just visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 475 to access the webinar resources, or you can simply click on the episode description wherever you stream your podcasts. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for yourself or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. You can click on the magazine tab of your screen to learn more and know that if you subscribe now, you will receive Attitude's special 25th anniversary commemorative issue coming out soon. Finally, the sponsor for today's webinar is Play Attention. Backed by research conducted by Tufts University School of Medicine, Play Attention provides the most advanced NASA-inspired technology that improves executive function and self-regulation. Turn your ADHD into your superpower. Our digital trainer will teach cognitive skills so you can improve attention, productivity, organization, and executive function. Your personal executive function coach can customize a play attention program for each family member. Your program will include a personal executive function coach to customize your plan along the way. Home and professional programs are available. Call 828-676-2240 or click the link on your screen to schedule your free one-on-one -on -one consultation. Visit playattention.com to learn more. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. All right, without any further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Ann Dolan. Ann, thank you for joining us again today and for leading this really timely discussion. Annie, thank you so much for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here this afternoon. You know, as you mentioned, I've been in um, education for over 30 years, and I started out my career as a public school special education teacher. And on the side, I actually had this side hustle where I would drive the kids homes and tutor them on a one to one basis. And I loved it. I loved getting to know the kids in a different way on a deeper level, seeing them improve. I loved getting to know their parents. And after a few years, I took a leap of faith um, and decided to follow my calling in life, which was helping kids one-to-one. -one. So I left my teaching job and founded Educational Connections, and that was 25 years ago. And over the years, the company has grown a lot. We serve kids across the country now. And over the 25 years, I've spoken to thousands of parents who've called our office looking for help for their kids. And sometimes they want a tutor, sometimes an executive function coach, sometimes 
a college consultant who specializes in ADHD. But there's one thing that every single parent has in common, and that is they're worried about the future of their child. And they're even more worried if the child has ADHD. Furthermore, if they themselves, as the parent or the guardian, has ADHD, it's even more complicated. And I tell you, this is not lost on me because I too have ADHD and so do both of my kids. Now, it's easy to think ADHD is just an issue of focusing or focusing long enough to getting something finished. But the reality is that if you know kids with ADHD, there's this other component that we don't think about all the time, but it is motivation. And why is it that kids with ADHD so often struggle with motivation when it comes to academics? Is it that they just don't want to do a good job in school or they don't care about their grades or maybe they're not cut out for learning? I don't believe that's any of it. I believe that one of the reasons we see this correlation is that kids with ADHD and everybody with ADHD has weak executive function skills. And it kind of makes sense because if you think about it, our kids have great intentions. They want to do a good job in school. They actually really do. Um, they want to please, but their ability to take their intention and turn it around to action is really compromised. And that's because things like keeping track of all their assignments, focusing on what they have to do, finishing that task, and then finding it the next day to turn it in. These are all executive functions. And so today, what I'd like to pr provide to you are solutions for lessening that divide between intention and action. So here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to discuss routines because actually they're different than schedules and routines can be pretty powerful. We'll talk about getting things done. This is the execution piece of schoolwork. Hard for kids, that and that part is hard for parents too. Resources, because you don't have to go at this alone. And then lastly, a real opportunity, communication. Because at the end of the day, it is our relationship with our kids that matters most. All right, so let's start out with number one, routines. You know, routines can be so helpful because we've all been in the midst of hectic days. Now, how many of you, and you don't have to write it in the chat, but just think to yourself, have you ever wanted a smoother day, a smoother week, but then chaos happens and life happens and everything just feels so all over the place? And it's an uphill battle with getting your child to comply with some of the basics. That's pretty normal, and that's where routines can come in to help you. Um, they are not the same as a schedule. So a schedule would be, all right, every day, my child's going to start homework at 4 o'clock. It's virtually impossible to keep regimented schedules because every day is different and stuff happens. However, we can have a routine about when to get started with homework. And this is the most common routine in households. And it's one that I would encourage you to consider if you don't have one. So there's lots of times kids can do their schoolwork, right? They can do it right after school, after a 30 minute break, before dinner, after dinner, for our real procrastinators, before bed, <laughs> for some of them before school and the, the next morning on the bus to school. And for some in the class period, right before they have to turn in the assignment. So for younger kids, what we know is they do need some downtime, but typically not a ton. Um, so about a 30-minute break tends to work well. It might be different every day. It could be they get home on Monday at 4, they get that 30-minute break. But on Tuesday, you work. You pick them up from aftercare. They still get the 30-minute break. Now, older kids often want to start later in the evening. And what I would encourage is considering maybe – getting them to start before dinner, even if it's just opening your laptop to see what you have that night, or maybe starting right after dinner or right after you get home from a sports practice. You know, we often focus on the end time for schoolwork. Parents will say, oh, my son, he's up so late at night. It's ridiculous. It's hard to control the end time. But what we do have more power over is that start time. And that tends to be more productive. Now, um, 
Having a routine also lends to something that I call the predictability factor. When kids know what to expect, they're more likely to follow through and they're less likely to push back. And who doesn't want that? All right, so here are some other routines. That's a daily routine, Monday through Friday or Monday through Thursday. Here's a weekly routine. I call this the Sunday session. And this is a time where you get everybody together, not just your kid with ADHD, but you and all your kids, if you have multiple kids, and you say, let's look at the week ahead. And during that time, again, everybody's participating. Um, hopefully, you can piggyback it off of something you already do, like dinner or maybe after a sports practice or coming home from an event. Um, and the reason you want to do this is it develops the skill, the executive function skill of planning. So if you have a younger child, you're going to say, let's look at the week ahead. And you might have something like this. This is a week at a glance calendar page. And I, I actually created this for you. Um, and if you want to download this, you can go to our website. I made a special page for all the resources I'm going to share today. And it is ectutoring.com slash attitude, A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E 2023. And you'll find everything there. So with the weekly roundup, you take your younger kids. They may not have homework yet, but they have extracurriculars. And you might say, hey, let's talk about the week ahead. What do you have coming up? It might be a quiz. It could be a test. It could be that they have violin practice on Tuesday or soccer practice on Thursday. Whatever it might be, you can help them to write it on the calendar or you write it with them. But you're having a discussion and you're previewing. I love this. And here's why. A visual always trumps a verbal. A visual trumps a verbal. And that means anytime it can be in writing, it's so much better for us and our kids. Because then they can just go up to the calendar and see what they have going on. Instead of, hey, mom, what time am I going to practice today? What do I have today? And it helps them be a little bit more independent. As kids get older, they may not be so into that. Some kids still need this. Whoops, sorry about that. But some kids, their needs evolve and their issues are more around school. Like what do they have going on? Big tests, big quizzes, big projects. And they may have that information in their portal. So this is a time where we, you can encourage your child to open up their laptop and look at their portal for the week. What do they have going on that they could consider getting started on now? Or are there any little tasks that could make their week easier, that could prepare them for a more organized week? I used to do the Sunday session with my kids when they were younger. And my youngest son, he's now 21. He's a senior in college. Um, I remember this day because he was a sophomore and he said to me, Mom, this is so dumb. Why do I have to do this? I already know what I have going on this week. I don't need any help. I said, I get it, Ethan. You know, don't worry. Just open your laptop and just double check and make sure. He's like, fine, whatever. So he opens up his laptop and he's click, clicking, clicking through his subjects. And within 10 seconds, he says, mom, oh my gosh, you've got to order me Catcher on the Rye on Amazon. I totally forgot. I have to bring it to school on Tuesday. And so the Sunday session can really help prevent some of those things from happening. It makes kids a little bit more prepared. We can also have routines that are um, regular occurrences that have to do with stuff. Oh, and one thing I forgot about this slide is that during this time, you can be doing the same thing. Now, you're not going to be looking to see if you have any tests or quizzes, but you can be looking at your schedule. Are there any appointments I can confirm? Could I be doing anything else to get ready? Um, when my kids were little, I used to be, I used to make my lunch for school the next day, or I would lay out my clothes. All of those things can be part of the Sunday session. All right, so on to the things, the organization of stuff. And that's where this idea of the launching pad comes in. So your launching pad is a bin, a box. I mean, it could honestly be like a little corner of your kitchen counter or the kitchen island, right? Um, the idea behind the launching pad is that at night, your kids put all the stuff they need for school the next day, their binder, their backpack, their musical instruments, their sports equipment, so that the next morning, they're launching into a new day in an organized fashion. Makes mornings so much easier. 
and it promotes that executive function skill of organization and planning. Same concept, but with digital devices. I often say to kids, hey, tuck your devices in. And this is one strategy that we didn't use, you know, five, 10 years ago, but our coaches use with our kids now because their electronics are really an important part of their success in school. I like this idea of putting your digital um, items in one place and plugged in at night for two reasons. One, it keeps devices out of kids' rooms at night. And two, ensures devices are charged. It is so, so common for kids to go to school with uncharged items, you know, devices. So they're in a class, they're working on their laptop, and it dies. We really want to help kids to prevent that. And so for that reason, we want to help them to encourage them to tuck their devices in at night. Another thing we can do is um, talk to kids in terms of best friends. You know, best friends um, with us, we go everywhere together with our best friend. And it's same with all the things that our kids need. So, for example, one strategy we'll teach kids is if you bring your laptop, wherever you go with your laptop, you should have your assignment notebook if that's what you're using to write down your assignment. They are best friends. They go everywhere together. If you have your phone, your best friend, its best friend is the charger. Your earbuds in case, your backpack and lunch, they're best friends too. They travel together. So it's just kind of like a catchy way of helping kids remember what goes with what. So I've talked about a couple of things so far. We talked about routines. Um, for getting started with work. We talked about the Sunday session. We talked about organizing physical things. I'm curious, what could work for you? So you don't have to type this in the chat, but I'm just curious what strategy would be helpful and think about it in your head. If you're also thinking, sounds great, but you don't know my kid. He won't do any of these things. And you're worried about buying from your child. I completely understand. And that's why I've set up this presentation so that the back half of it is all about communicating with kids to get their buy-in. All right, so we discussed routines. Let's transition to getting things done. And again, this is the ex execution part of things. It is hard for parents and kids. The good news is there are simple strategies that can help a, an awful lot. And there are also ways to outsource some of these things. So as a parent or a guardian, you don't have to feel like it's all up to you and everything is on your shoulders. So let's start out with the basics. I call this the homework hotspot. Simply put, this is where your child is going to do homework. They can have a couple of homework hotspots, but we want the homework hotspot, the main place they do their work, to be conducive to focus. <laughs> Have you ever watched the Super Bowl and noticed that it's on for an awful long time? It's on for about four hours, but they only play the game for one hour. Some of our students are like this when they go to do their homework. They're up in their room for so long that they barely have anything to show for it. They may have only a half hour or an hour's worth of homework done. I call these kids Super Bowl kids. And, it's, and it happens most when kids are doing homework in their room, which is really hard to focus in your room, and especially since COVID. Before COVID, I saw more often that kids would maybe sit down at a desk or like have a little table to do their work. And then it kind of gravitated to sitting on their bed and then under their sheets. <laughs> and so when the kids are doing work on their bed, it's kind of harder, a little bit harder to focus. So if your child is older and it's you don't want to fight the battle of you can't do homework in your room anymore because that won't work, um, just make sure that they have a, a, as much as possible a clutter-free desk or a space that's cleaned off to do their work. Um, and ideally, if you can encourage them on a regular basis, could be part of the Sunday session, to organize that space, it will really help them. An organized space is an organized mind. Um, and this works for younger and older kids. Now, for really young kids, though, elementary school, 
you may find that they do best in a place where you have earshot, maybe like the dining room table. So you can look over every now and then just to make sure that they're on task. Now, in a homework hotspot, we want to make sure as much as possible that we ditch digital distractions. So that means we wouldn't want the homework hotspot to be in a room where the TV is also going, because that would be distracting. Um, also, kids will often say, I have to have my phone for my work, which isn't always true, by the way. Um, but we can encourage them, put it on the other side of the room, or oh, just turn it over, put it in airplane mode or minimize all those other screens you have open or click out of those, that can help too. So now kids have a plan. They have really a, a plan that you've set up for them. I call it the guardian game plan. They have a basic routine to do their work. Um, they have a homework hotspot. And the other thing that I might recommend is to focus on completion rather than quality. Um, by that I mean, as parents and caregivers, we don't always have to make sure where the we don't ever have to make sure we're the homework police. For example, if we're the homework police over quality, it looks like this. Did you spell every word correctly? How many adjectives do you have in that set in that sentence? Is that enough? Did you write down all the steps to your math equation? Your teacher said to show the work. Those things, when we focus on the quality of the assignment, really invite power struggles with our kids. So instead, we don't really wanna worry about quality so much, leave that up to the teacher, but really just focus on getting it done and encourage kids just to finish it and turn it in. Inevitably, when kids are doing their work though, they're gonna get stuck. And I've seen over the years that kids with ADHD get most stuck and most avoidant in the two areas with the most working memory, math and writing. Both of these areas require the brain to hold a lot of information and process it at the same time you're doing something. And so when kids are stuck, let's say it's in math, we have three choices as the parent if they come to us for help. We can say, listen, Jimmy, this is your homework, not mine. I already went to fifth grade which probably isn't the best answer because not only do we want our kids to come to us if they need help, later on when things are way more important than homework, we want them to feel like they can come to us. Or we could say, oh, I know how to do that one. Let me show you, this is how you do it. And inevitably your child will say, that's not how Mrs. Smith says to do it because it never is. Or you could say, oh, do you have examples of this one in your notes or your book? Doesn't that math teacher put the class notes online? I wonder if there's a similar problem there. And this is the best answer because it helps kids to help themselves. Over time, they can come become more independent by seeking out examples on their own, but at first it may need to be with your guidance. Now, we can also reach out to resources. If our kids are stuck regularly, we need to talk to the teacher. And in just a minute, I'm gonna talk about best ways to approach teachers. But what I will share is that schools have research resources for kids. Some schools may have a homework club. Some schools may have after school teacher hours. There could be a late bus. Some schools have resource periods during the day where kids can go and ask for help. Sometimes it may be that you're looking for a resource outside of the of school. It could be the college student down the street who can be, who's willing to help your child. It could be a professional like a tutor or an executive function coach that could also help your child. And if that's the case and a professional is something that you're thinking about, we're happy to help you with that as well. So let's go back to the teacher part. You know, oftentimes when we talk to teachers, Sometimes things don't come out the way we mean them to. And using the words I've noticed can be super helpful. I kind of feel like there are two magic words. Um, you're really using these words to show that you've observed something and you're not placing blame on the teacher. So um, you might say, Jimmy's really struggling with this math. He seems stuck. 
and I'm not sure how to help him. Do you have suggestions? So all you're doing is observing the observable. The other day I went to pick up my bicycle. It was getting repaired. And when I went into the shop, I was talking to the manager there and he said, oh, so you're, you have a tutoring business. And I said, I do. And he's like, oh, I wish I knew you when my son was in ninth grade. And I said, why? What happened? And he said, oh, my gosh, we were fighting all the time over math. And he really didn't know how to do it. He was always frustrated. He was practically in tears. And I just got so sick of it. I shot off this note to the teacher. And I said, this math is ridiculous. He doesn't know how he's how to do it. It's been going on for so long. And he's not going to do it anymore. And after that, our relationship was really fractured. And he said, I wish I approached it differently. Um, and he said, and I also wish that I probably got somebody to help him, like a tutor. And I just didn't think of it at the time. And those things can happen. You know, when our kids are stressed, we're stressed. And so often we approach teachers with, you know, a different mindset than we're meaning. So that's why I'm sharing these words I've noticed can make a big difference in the relationship we have with educators. Also, other people outside of parents and guardians have what I call the non-parent advantage. And that means they don't have emotional history with the student. Kids are far more willing to take suggestions from somebody else and not the parent. And if you find that this is the case, you know, look at the attitude directory for somebody that can help your child. Make sure they have experience with ADHD and a process behind it. Um, parents often ask, you know, what is, I know what a tutor is, that's like helping with subjects, but what is an executive function coach? You know, my child has a lot of issues with managing time, study habits, organization, that type of thing. And so I thought it would be helpful if I shared with you how we help students so that you understand what an executive function coach does. And you'll also pick up some strategies that can help you at home. So when we work with kids, our first step is to help them to go through all their subjects and figure out what they've got to do. Now, every school's um, portal is different. Some schools are on Canvas, some have Google Classroom, some have Schoology, some have Blackboard. And there, kids can open up each subject. And by the way, we do this virtually, and it works beautifully. Kids do not need to be sitting next to somebody to do this work. Um, so we have them open up, say English, show me what you have going on in English. So then we can see and talk to them about what's due short term, what's due long term and how they're doing. And is there any missing work? And we do that for each subject. And then we help them to figure out, OK, you've got this due on Friday. Um, let's say it's an English essay. And depending on the portal or the software, it will usually take that English essay due Friday and populate it to the calendar. So when the student opens their calendar, they see exactly what's due. But what it doesn't do is take that essay that's due on Friday and say, oh, here's how you can break it down and get it done to turn it in on time on Friday. But we do that with kids and this skill is called calendaring. And so we'll say, okay, what are the steps that you need to do to get this done on Friday? What could you do on Wednesday? What could you do on Thursday? Let's talk about those tasks and then put them into your calendar. And we call this part looking for weird windows. Weird windows are these little pockets of time that kids would otherwise be scrolling through social media. Maybe it's the half hour on Tuesday waiting to go to their allergy shot appointment or when they get home from soccer on Thursday at five o'clock. So within these weird windows, that's where we help kids to figure out what they're going to put into them. Um, and then we want to know, based on what the student has to do that day, what is hardest for you? And we work to finish those tasks with the student. And I share that because if you find somebody who does these things in theory and does like all the skills, calendaring and organizing, all that stuff, but the child doesn't feel like they got anything done, all bets are off. They want to feel like they actually accomplished something too. And for us, we want to help them with the hardest task so we can teach them skills for getting started. Um, that's where they're most likely to procrastinate. They're often able to do the easier things. And then my favorite part of the session, and this is what we did the last five minutes, 
is we'll help them anticipate the obstacles. So we might say, um, oh, you said you were going to use that graphic out organizer to write, um, uh, to, to format your paragraphs for your essay on Wednesday night. What could get in your way? And we hear all things, different kinds of things from kids like, oh, I forgot I have a lacrosse banquet that night. I'm not sure when I get home, what time I'll get home. Okay, let's talk about this. Oh, I'm binge watching this show on Netflix. Um, to be honest, I'm in season three. <laughs> and so we'll say, okay, we get it. Okay, let's talk about what you're going to do if you feel like you're going to procrastinate. And we share different strategies. We talk through different strategies, but I'm going to share with you a couple of my favorite right now. Um, we tell kids, you know, it is not your fault if your brain wants to watch Netflix instead of doing this hard work in math, because your brain is naturally going to gravitate to something easy, passive, where you get lots of dopamine hits, not something hard and arduous. Your job is to trick your brain into thinking that this task, this task of math, isn't that bad after all. So you can do it by using a timer. I love timers. Um, they're one of my favorite tools. And so we'll teach kids to set it for a super short amount of time, like 10 minutes. We call that the tolerable 10. Anybody can tolerate anything for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And you say to yourself, I'm going to work super hard just during this 15 minutes. I'm going to get rid of all my distractions. Um, or we'll teach them to use the Pomodoro method. And this was invented in the late 80s by a researcher, an Italian researcher, um, who wanted to see what is that sweet spot when you're working independently where you're most motivated and less likely to be distracted. Is it 10 minutes? Is it a half hour, an hour and a half? What is it? And he found it's like 25 minutes. And so um, we'll teach kids. Oh, and by the way, it's called Pomodoro because in Italian, Tomato is, um, this, he did the research on this tomato timer. Tomato is Pomodoro. And so we'll teach kids to set your timer just for 25 minutes, get rid of your distractions, work super hard, and then take a five minute break. And what we find is that kids with ADHD might just do one Pomodoro and take a break. They might be able to then do another Pomodoro. So maybe one or two. This would not be for elementary school. This is more for middle high school college students. Um, what he did find is that the Pomodoro, your brain can only sustain, even for adults, four Pomodoros in a row. So it looks like this. Pomodoro, break, Pomodoro, break, Pomodoro, break, Pomodoro. But again, just getting started with one or two is really fine for kids. So now kids have a game plan in place. They know what to do. Um, they've calendared their assignments. They've looked for weird windows. They've gotten the hardest thing done. They, we talked about anticipating obstacles, so they have a game plan in place. But what often happens is that, you know, when kids first start, they're super resistant. And so if you're thinking, my child is that resistant kid, it's so, so normal. And when we could talk to parents, they say that all the time. I'm not sure my child will buy into this. Um, the reason it's normal is that change it varies from individual. So if a person wants to make change, they go through these steps. And this is called the stages of change. Um, I, I want to share with you a story of a, a mom that I talked to. This was last school year, but she still stands out in my mind because she was so adamant about her son. And when she we started talking, um, she said, look, my son is so disorganized. He's he just doesn't know where anything is. He can never turn things on on time. It's a mess. And he was out of school for a week because he had COVID. And when he got back, instead of doing the work, he just got frozen. He avoided it. He became overwhelmed and he didn't do anything. And I'm really worried about him. And she said, I said, okay, got it. I understand. Um, we got a coach to work with him. We assigned one of our coaches to work with him. He thought we, we thought would be a really good match for him. And they started working together. And what she realized at first, because we have this little survey we give kids on these stages of change, that he couldn't have cared less about organization. He thought he was perfectly organized. Um, so he was on this ladder at the pre-contemplation stage at the very bottom of the ladder for organization. Turns out he was at the preparation stage 
for studying and, and learning study techniques for the science test he had. And he was also at that stage because he, he wanted to make up that work in science. He liked science. He thought he might want to study it later on in college. And so that's where we started. And I share this with you because often, you know, what the parent or the guardian wants is different from what the child is willing to do. So the first step is to determine the starting point. We eventually came through the back door and worked on the organization piece with him, but not at first. He wasn't willing to go there. These processes take time. So it takes time for kids to go through these stages, learn new habits, and develop them and practice them too. Um, and you can learn more about the stages of change if that's of interest to you on our website as well. If you're curious, you know, could this model benefit my child? Um, I'm not sure if this is a match or not. We're happy to talk to you about your child too. You can scan this QR code and it will take you to our calendar to set up a time to talk. And I'll show this again in a few minutes. So don't worry if you don't get it right now. All right, so question, what's your biggest takeaway at this point? What has resonated with you? And I ask you that because I shared some strategies, but now we're gonna get into something really different. We're gonna talk about communicating with our kids so that we can maintain that connection with them, which is so, so important. You know, if you have ADHD like I do, you may feel like you are do doing double duty in your life. You've got your own problems with the issues surrounding ADHD. And now you have this kid who also has the same problems. So it's like we're doing double duty, you know, double the amount of parenting, right? Um, and so that's why communication and connection is our biggest opportunity. It's the one thing we can control the most. Our kids need positivity from us. They really do. And part of the reason they need such positivity is because kids with ADHD can often get caught in the doom loop. So what is the doom loop? Here it goes. Your student gets a bad grade. And when kids get a bad grade or they have missing work, they get criticism from others. Maybe the parent, perhaps the teacher, maybe the sports coach. And when that happens, they have lowered confidence. And when you have lowered confidence, that results in reduced effort. And when you're not putting forth a lot of effort, you get a bad grade again. And it really looks like you've got this big motivation issue. So we want to get our kids out of the doom loop. And one of the first things we can do is set up a time to talk with our kids. Um, so we might say something like, can we talk after dinner tonight? Kind of like set up an appointment. And the reason I like that idea is that kids feed off our energy. So if we just found out that your child has five missing assignments um, and you're upset over it or they have a really bad grade and you just found out about it, that's when negativity will happen. You're going to talk to them in a different way as, with, as if you approach them with a much calmer mind. And so do a self-check. Think, am I anxious? Am I overly concerned? Am I super worried? If so, maybe later on is a better time to address this with my child. Because ultimately, we want to help our kids break free of the doom loop. And we can do it by connection and conversation. We can also use those words I've noticed, which I talked about earlier. They're even more powerful with kids. So here's how we often approach kids when we're upset. How do you already have three missing math assignments? It's only October. Or we might say, if you don't understand these math equations, why didn't you go talk to your teacher? I told you to go see her last week and you didn't do it. Or we could approach it differently using I've noticed. I've noticed it's hard to stay on top of your math work. Tell me about that. I've noticed equations are hard. I get it. This is some tough stuff. Tell me what's going on. And so you're inviting the conversation. You are not trying to solve the problem in that moment. That's not our job when our, we're all upset to solve the problem. All we wanna do is empathize, nod and listen, 
and really amp it up so that kids feel heard, so that we're good listeners and we're building trust with our kids. Again, I put all this stuff on the same link. So you can, I wrote out script by script for you um, how to address certain things. And it's all on the website, which is ectutoring.com slash attitude 2023. Um, we can also promote open-ended conversations by saying things like, tell me more about it. I totally get that. What happened? Or what makes you say that? I know. I can tell you feel strongly about this. I get that you're frustrated. All those things, again, help kids feel heard. Now, I got to be honest and say, these things are easier said than done. It's easy to have this idea for one day, and then on day two, it goes by the wayside. But there are little, little strategies we can use to kind of keep ourselves in check and keep it positive. And that's where the three to one ratio comes in. I actually got this strategy from a friend of mine. Michelle Mullally, who um, came to do a presentation at this ADHD summit we have. I'll share with you about that in a second. But anyways, um, she said the three to one ratio is, is really proven by research, not just for parents and kids, but relationships in the workplace with your spouse, all kinds of relationships. So what it says is that three positive comments neutralize a negative one, right? So... The reason this is important is that kids with ADHD tend to be pretty sensitive to negative comments. So we, throughout the day, we can kind of be making a deposit into the piggy bank. We can say little things like, oh, I'm so glad you're home. I love seeing you. You look amazing today in that new shirt. I love how you started on that math right away. I can tell you're super focused today. What a good idea to turn off the TV. Um, you know, I'm so excited to have dinner with you tonight. All of those things are positive comments. It could be a pat on the back. It could be a hug. It could be, I love you. Positive comments amp up motivation. And so here's what I was mentioning earlier. So Michelle did a presentation for us, and this was a summit we had. There are one-hour sessions every day on nag-free parenting. We had um, Bob Brooks do resilience and motivation. We had um, a psychiatrist do digital addiction, which I found to be super fascinating. Um, somebody on Roadmap to College talking about college planning for kids with ADHD. And then our last topic was study skills and organization. And so again, you, if, if one of these sounds interesting to you, you can find all that and download these on our website. Um, okay, so here's another strategy that can be helpful. And it's nag-free time zones. And this is where you're setting up time during the day where you agree with your child not to do any nagging. Ideally, this is around dinner time. Maybe it's, you know, something traditional where everybody's having dinner at the same time and you don't talk about school and you definitely don't nag. It could be in the car because you're eating McDonald's in the car. It could be when you're at Taco Bell. It doesn't matter. This is just the time where you just share information and kids know they can come to this meal and not feel um, nagged and not feel judged at all. This is a really positive experience. So the good news is that kids with ADHD improve as they get older. It does get better as kids get older. So I want you to take just a moment and imagine the future. Your kids have graduated from college. Um, you have great memories of really having a positive relationship with them throughout the years. You had some awesome nag-free dinners that you are, really remember. Some days your kids were motivated, some days not so much, but they had the tools to get them through, and that is what's possible. So my hope today as we finish up this webinar is that I gave you some practical action items that you see the big picture, that there are small things we can do, even if it's just one thing that can make a difference to our kids. And it really is through positive communication and connection with our kids um, that we can improve motivation. It was a pleasure to speak to you um, today, and please know that we're here to help. So if you find that your child may need a little extra support, um, we're happy to chat with you. And this is a QR code that you can scan. Um, we help kids throughout the country virtually um, with tutoring, executive function coaching, and college planning. 
Kathy, Jennifer, and Ann Stewart um, are happy to speak to you about your child. So I'd love to wrap up in Annie and um, go to Q&A now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, we do have a lot of good questions. I will just quickly thank Play Attention once more for sponsoring today's webinars. And I wanted to touch on the results from our little survey um, that we did at the beginning. And it, it kind of just illuminates some of the biggest pain points that um, parents, caregivers are feeling in ADHD households. The number one service that people would choose if they could win anyone for a year would be a housekeeper to clean and tidy. 37% of people said that. And then sort of tied neck and neck were a tutor slash homework overseer for my child um, and a personal chef to make all of the family meals. Um, and then the others were sort of way down the list beside behind those. So those were the uh, the top three, and those will tie into the questions that we got here today. But actually, the first one I wanted to get to had to do kind of with the doom loop and more of the self-esteem components that you were talking about toward the end. Mm -hmm. um, a number of people want to know how they can better communicate to their child that perhaps their motivation challenges, organization challenges are tied to their ADHD, that they're not personal faults, that they're not laziness, that, um, yes, if you have any ideas for scripts on how to communicate to them in a way that helps to build their self-confidence. Sure, Annie, I, I talk to kids about this all the time, even my own kids when they were younger, and they'd be frustrated. And I'd say, look, it's not your fault. This isn't a character trait. It's how your brain works. And people with ADHD has so many amazing strengths, but there are things that get in the way. And these are the glitches that we all encounter. Um, so with a, kids with ADHD tend to procrastinate a little bit more. And so if we can share the reason this happens is because the brains of people with ADHD don't, don't give as much dopamine. And so sometimes kids will get started on something, see it for, through and feel really good about it. But that's not always the case with kids with ADHD. So when our brains are wired a little bit different, we just have to figure out strategies around it. And um, if you also have ADHD, talking about, you know, what happened to you in school, because I got to think, you know, parents with ADHD has many of the same struggles um, and how you overcame it as an adult, if things got better for you as an adult, which they often do, especially, you know, when kids can find what they're passionate about in life, um, I would start there. And that's kind of the other part of it, Annie. You know, many of our kids do grow up to be amazing adults because they find what they're really good at and what they're passionate about. But in school, you have to be good at everything. And it's so hard. But as an adult, you really only have to be good at one main thing and probably a few other things. And so helping kids to think about what life is like after high school um, can be a positive conversation. That's a really great point. If I was being graded on my ability to do chemistry today, I would be really down in the dumps. <laughs> um, so I, I love that idea that um, it's all about whittling it down to your strengths and your passions. Um, okay, so sort of two themes have emerged here today. One is um, getting past defiance. Kids who just really drag their feet um, on routines, um, and some of these other suggestions here, um, the homework hotspot and organization schemes. Um, someone asks, is it okay to offer monetary rewards to keep your kid motivated and using the tools and systems you set up? Um, sometimes. And the reason I say sometimes is that before I go in that direction, what I might do is think more about what I can notice with my child. Like if I ever see them doing something in the right direction, even just like opening a book or starting on their homework at a decent hour, I want to be all over that. I want to really recognize effort and try to be as positive as I can around effort, not really worrying about, did you get an A or not or a B? But really the minute you see your child put forth effort in the right direction, you know, really, really praise them. There's a great book, um, 
called Mindset by Carol Dweck. And uh, she's a um, researcher out of Stanford. And it's just an awesome book about how the words we use can have profound effects on kids' motivation. Um, but about rewards, there was a study done with, I believe it was Chicago Public School Systems, and they wanted to, they looked at, would paying kids for certain things result in um, better outcomes? So they paid kids for getting good grades, for being at school on time, and for reading books. And, and not a lot of money, a few bucks. This was a while back. <laughs> um, but what they found is that it worked for getting to school on time and for reading, but it totally did not work for grades. And the reason is that getting to school on time and reading a book, especially if you're in like second grade, it's short term, right? You can do that quickly. But a grade is nine weeks away and it's actually very complicated. So instead of paying kids for things like that, I might recommend a privilege like, um, hey, if you come down um, for school on time with your teeth brushed, dressed, and you have your coat, then you can watch 15 minutes of TV before you catch the bus. Those little rewards are better than paying kids for something, especially something that's long-term and complicated. Mm -hmm. I wonder um, your thoughts on, is it appropriate to war reward kids for asking for help? You can certainly do that. Um, you can, you know, anytime they do something in the right direction, like asking for help, you can certainly reward it. Really, what I think it's about is noticing the behavior because, you know, if, if they can see that they're in the midst of it and you recognize that, that's what they need. They need affirmation around just doing the behavior. It kind of makes me think of when my younger son was really, really young. He had this really bad habit of biting his nails to the quick and they were bleeding all the time. And um, so a fr I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do about this. So a friend of mine said, do this. Anytime you, you tell him, I will give you a quarter. Anytime you're no you notice you're about to do it. So if you start to raise your hand to your mouth and you notice it and you say, I'm about to do this, I'll give you a quarter. And that's how he stopped doing that behavior. So it's the same thing. If kids are starting to notice, oh, um, I can chat with my teacher or I can send her an email and they're just noticing the behavior, that is affirmation. And also, really, once kids get a positive reply back from their teacher, that's often all they need to get started and get over the hump. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those skills that absolutely pays dividends in college, being able to yeah. advocate and ask for help, right? Yeah, okay, like so a number of people today were asking about homework that is done, but done very sloppily. So full of mistakes, maybe the motivation is to get to that device or, you know, that video game, um, or they just rush through it because it is a despised mm -hmm. task. But who, how do we handle this um, effectively? Well, one thing we can consider is not to give reward homework completion with a video game. So that promotes, you know, rushing. Um, so if we say, oh, finish your homework and then you can have access to all your games, you're just going to have a kid that might have two hours of homework that they do in 20 minutes. And so we can say you can have access to your games at seven o'clock or 630. So later on in the day might be better. I've also found that I, I haven't actually found the solution to this because if you have a child who maybe is sloppy with the steps that they have to write down to solve a math equation, for example, it's kind of like a bell curve. Like when you start out the assignment, you're ramping up your energy, you're in the thick of things, you're solving the problems. And at the end, you're all the way back down the curve. So when you say as a parent, oh, you didn't do this right, go back and check your work to the kid, that's like, oh, I've got to climb this hill again and get back up here. That's so unappealing. And it's really, really hard to get kids to go back and check their work. What you might have more success doing, or which I found to be more productive with kids, is to say before they start, um, and this isn't micromanaging the effort on the other side, but in the beginning, say, hey, do, do you have a rubric for this? 
did your teacher give you a rubric on how this is graded? Can you take that out? Or, oh, I know um, your teacher is really specific about writing down the steps. And you can have the child take out a sample of writing down the steps if they have it in their notes. Or maybe you jot on a post-it note, um, write out each step. And you do that at the beginning. That puts it in the child's mind that I really need to think about this as I'm going on. And that's much easier than approaching it from the other side. Okay, great. And then uh, sort of related, but this question of you know a, a student who they're working on um, a calendaring system. In this case, they have a whiteboard in the house to remind about deadlines, which are also posted online, but still the parents are hearing, I forgot it was due, or I didn't know we had to turn this one in for a grade. Um, <laughs> what are what are some of the next steps for parents who are sort of trying these things and getting frustrated with these answers? Sure. I, I, you know, usually there's one of two reasons this happens. Either the, the child is the assignment feels really hard to them and they're not quite sure how to do it. So they're saying, I didn't know I had to do this. You know, I didn't know this was a grade. So they're avoiding it or they really don't know. And they're, they're just disorganized and they didn't realize they had to do it. Maybe it was on the whiteboard and they didn't pay attention to it. So it's more of an executive function issue. Um, so when that happens, you know, you have to decide, is it this or is it that? And an easy way to do it is to use a scale of one to five, kind of like a Google review. One is awful and five is amazing. And so you say to your child, okay, when it comes to this assignment, does it feel really easy? Like, um, does it feel really hard and awful and you don't want to do it? Or does it feel like pretty good and, and you can do this and it's a five? So if they say it's a one, a two, maybe a three, that's a sign that the content might be hard for them and they're going to need help. So it's going to be more than don't forget to do this. That stuff won't work with that issue. If it's, oh my gosh, this is so easy. That's when it's probably in more of an executive function issue. And so in that case, it may be a different way of setting up a system of a reminder for them. And so I'd approach it differently than if it's the content. Okay. And we did get a question um, regarding, you know, when uh, one parent has ADHD and the other doesn't, and they are um, parenting from, from different households, mm -hmm. how to work toward consistency in getting these routines set up. Wondering if you have advice for that when maybe the parent with ADHD is understandably struggling more to keep the routine consistent. Yeah, I might have a discussion and ask, you know, the, both parents get together and say, what is the one thing we can do? And sometimes hard things for kids and hard things for adults can be boiled down to this concept called the one thing. Like if we did this thing, it would be, it would be, have a pronounced difference. However, we're only committing to doing this one thing and it has to be easy enough for the parent with ADHD to do it. Um, and so you got to sit down and figure out what would that be and have that conversation. It might be that um, it's a nightly check-in for five minutes with the child about what to do the next day. It might be that, you know, it is a, a weekly type of thing. Um, it might be different things depending on what the child needs, but I would take the one thing approach and see if you can find commonality over that one thing. Wonderful. Good advice. Um, okay. And one last one um, regarding college students. So specifically those college students who maybe did not, for one reason or another, um, develop really good organization and coping mechanisms while in high school. Um, what is sort of the first step? towards setting them up for success when we know the executive function challenges of being in college on your own? Well, if they haven't started yet, um, one of the things that I would consider is going to the learning center. And every college and university has one on campus. And this is a place where you can get free help. Um, and so going there with your child, making sure they understand why they can come there. And it's not just for subject help. It's not just like for writing help or chemistry, but they will help you with other skills too. 
making sure the child knows how to make an appointment. You can also set up reoccurring appointments. So that could be an option too. But really knowing that the child has the resources for them. Um, we help kids in college all the time. There are also other folks out there that specialize in helping college students. But college students have their unique issues. It's super different than students from high school um, because they have these large periods of time that are unscheduled that they did not have in high school. So finding um, either the learning center or somebody, or it could even be the parent, each week you talk to them. It's kind of like weird windows in a way, but you're saying, tell me about your schedule this week. What do you have coming up? Um, during this two-hour block, where might you go? And where might you go is actually really helpful to college students because it shouldn't always be in their dorm room. That's when they get off track. They'll play video games, do other things. So which library are you going to go to that's near your class? Um, where will you go is a question that any parent can ask. And having those discussions before the week starts can be really helpful. Wonderful. Love that specific advice. And thank you so much for um, for joining us today and for contributing your expertise and your strategies to our community. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Annie. Absolutely. And thank you for everyone who joined us. We, we hope you'll join us again. We have free webinars every week here at Attitude. And to make sure you don't miss that or any other future webinars, or articles or research updates, you can sign up to receive our e free email newsletters at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, just visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 475 to access the webinar resources, or you can simply click on the episode description wherever you stream your podcasts. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for yourself or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a wonderful day and a great week. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. For more Attitude podcasts and information on living well with attention deficit, visit AttitudeMag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.